So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation today, you can type them into the Q&A at the bottom uh, toolbar on the Zoom screen. And this webinar will be recorded and you will receive a link to the recording later on this afternoon. Thank you. Go ahead, Lionel. Thanks, Lori. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, March 1st uh, edition of, uh, of Crop Talk. So uh, I don't know if it's coming in like a lion, but uh, it's a little bit cold, but besides that, it's a pretty nice day out there. So hopefully we're not uh, gonna see some uh, uh, bad things by the end of the month, but uh, hopefully it's just gonna be warmer. So it'll go out like a lamb. So uh, anyways, today uh, we are uh, gonna be uh, looking at some management practice to aid in delaying weed resistance on our, on our farms and uh, we uh, have Kim Brown Livingston with us, uh, our provincial weed specialist, and Kim spends a lot of her time nowadays working on weed resistance because it's becoming a pretty major issue. And I thought it'd be a good thing to uh, to get her on and go through uh, some of the things that she's been doing, some of the things she's been learning, and some of the uh, new things on the way. And this way, we can kind of, you know, start our plans for this coming season. And uh, then after that. Uh, uh, a lot of the crop scouting panel is away at meetings, so we uh, we don't have a lot of uh, them on today, but uh, if there is some questions, we'll try to get them answered uh, at the end and then uh, and go from there. So uh, I'm going to just uh, change my screen here now uh, to uh, uh, grab Kim's presentation. And... There it is. Uh, today, uh, what's going to happen is uh, we're at, just had a little bit of difficulty with Kim's being able to go into. Hey, Lionel, uh, I've got to interrupt. I can't. I'm still seeing yours, um, your presentation. You'll probably have to um, unshare and then reshare Kim's. Okay. Or a new share, that's what we needed to do, I guess. Yes, yes. There we go, I can see it. Yeah, if you want slideshow okay. it and then we should be good. Perfect. So the technology was giving us a bit of an issue this morning, but uh, we've solved the problem. And Kim, if you're ready, uh, you just tell me what you want to advance to your next slide and we'll go from there. Sure, uh, just go to the next slide, please. So first of all, um, anyways, thanks. I should say thanks, Lionel, for having me on. I think that uh, weed resistance is the biggest um, problem we're going to see in weed, in anything to do with weeds going forward. It's just the resistance is growing and growing. I'm going to start, um, I'm going to show you some of where we're at with that. Um, we ha will have some new data coming on where we're sitting with weed resistance um, within the next year because we've recently done another survey, but uh, it's the single biggest problem we're facing in, in weed when it comes to weed control right now. So I first of all though, wanted to stop about herbicide resistance versus tolerance. And resistance is actually um, the weed's ability to survive and reproduce following exposure to a dose of a herbicide that normally would be lethal. And this can be selected for, or it might be induced by genetic engineering, um, but versus tolerance where a species was always unaffected by the herbicide and there is no selection pressure and or genetic manipulation. And so, we see this, I think a lot of times too, we see some weeds that maybe have escaped or didn't, we didn't get good control. And I'm particularly, I'm thinking of something like a uh, field uh, horsetail and you know, it, everybody says it's resistant to Roundup. Well, it's not. Roundup never really, or glyphosate never really worked on it anyways. Uh, so that's a tolerance. And some weeds are just naturally more tolerant to some chemistries than others. Um, field, uh, biennial wormwood is another one. And uh, even, you know, cer certain things are just more tolerant to certain chemistries. So we need to make sure too that we're, you know, we're distinguishing between that because not all weeds that escape are resistant. Sometimes there's a tolerance. And sometimes when we see weed escapes, there's a numerous other reasons that it could be. Um, but we do have to always have that in the back of our mind that we've got, you know, a new resistance problem. So next slide, please. So 
So this is uh, just the process of selection for herbicide resistance. And basically it's, there's millions of weeds out there on the acres that we're growing. And just they'll genetically be something about some weeds that are just different than others. They'll normally, they'll just naturally have a mutation that the other ones don't. Um, with millions and millions of plants, there's just the, the odds are that there's going to be some that have a genetic mutation already. And basically what we do is because they don't die when we spray them with certain chemistries, we select for them because we kill all the other weeds that the herbicide still works on. And eventually at the end of the day, if you go, um, you know, if you look at the right hand side of the screen there, uh, you end up with mostly a resistant population because we've done a really good job at killing all the ones that don't have that mutation. And we're allowing uh, these other weeds to survive and breed and, and reproduce and set seed. And then there's more and more and more of them all the time. And that's basically what happens. So we don't notice that we've got resistant individuals individuals at the very beginning, there's one or two weeds. And then all of a sudden, you know, within a number of years, uh, we've selected um, to have um, the entire population is nothing but resistant weeds. Next slide, please. So when we look at um, the risk of resistance, and um, this is from, uh, from a website that I'm going to talk about later on, uh, there's some really good websites out there about herbicide resistance. And they talk about whether you're, you can kind of rate yourself, whether you're a low risk, a moderate risk or a high risk. And basically, um, there's a number of criteria there when you're looking at um, a herbicide mix or rotation in the cropping system. Uh, you know, if you have more than two mechanisms of action, then you're a low risk. But if you only are using one mechanism of action, and that, that would be something like using glyphosate repeatedly and nothing but. And that's where in the States and in other places in the world where they had a lot of Roundup Ready crops and they used nothing but straight glyphosate with no tank mixes and nothing else, uh, they ended up with glyphosate resistant weeds very quickly because they were only ever using one mechanism of action. Um, when you're looking at weed control in the cropping system, um, you know, you're low risk if you're looking at if you're using cultural, mechanical and chemical, but if you're using chemical alone, you would be at high risk. And of course, moderate is going to be in between those extre extremes. When you're looking at using the same mechanism of action per season, uh, if you're using that once, you're low risk, but if you're using that many times, and again, that comes to mind in those things like our glyphosate, sometimes we're using our group 14s as pre-burns, and then again, during the season, and then again, during um, for harvest aid management, you know, we see we're using the the same mode of action many times that does put you at a higher risk when you're looking at a cropping system if you've got a full rotation and that would be you know multiple crops multiple um, types of crops like winter annuals versus spring annuals and broadly for versus cereal crops and that type of thing that puts you at a low risk still you're not a zero risk you're never at a zero risk but you're at a lower risk um, versus no rotation and that again comes to mind where we've got people that are uh, farmers that are in a straight soybean rotation straight corn rotations or even very limited rotations that which are like corn soybeans corn soybeans corn soybeans type thing um and the, the resistant status um, to mechanism mechanism of action, um, if it's unknown, you're at a low risk, but if it's common and it's in the area and it's around and you know, you're know you going to be selecting for that, that'd be high risk. If your weed infestation is low, um, that's good, you're low risk, but if you've got high, high pressures, then obviously you have more weeds out there and you just have more chances of having those resistant individuals in that population because it's just a numbers game. And your weed, you need to look at your weed control in the last three years. If it's been good, uh, you're still at a low risk again never at a zero risk but low is good um, but if you've got poor weed control and you're noticing lots of weed escapes then you could be at a high risk of resistance and obviously again moderate a risk it would be somewhere in the middle so uh, next slide please so our global cases of herbicide resistance, Canada has the dubious honor of being third in the world uh, for number of cases of herbicide resistance. And since the 1990s, we've been actually getting about two species a year, uh, two new species a year developing resistance in Canada. Uh, number one would be um, uh, Australia and the States um, is actually the States and then Australia, I guess, um, is where we fall right behind those guys. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the uh, unique herbicide resistant weeds in Canada. We can see that it's been a pretty steady increase since the 70s, actually. And um, and that not that line is just going up and up and up. And um, we, since about nine, since since the recent numbers are there's about 80 different species in Canada right now. And, and between Western Canada and Eastern Canada. And uh, so, yeah, and that number is not going to go down. We fully expect that to keep increasing um, just the way it is. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is actually, and, and uh, if you can do the next slide too, there's some animation here, there's a line, <laughs> just to show you that this is the, uh, the uh, induction, introduction time of new herbicide sites of action. So when we're talking about rotating herbicides, we're talking about rotating groups. Um, we want you to be using different groups as much as you can. And we can see that, you know, between the 1950s and 1980s, there was a steady increase of herbicide new herbicide groups. There has not been a new herbicide group since the mid 80s. That group 28 that came on just a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2021, um, that's for rice. So we are not be able to use any of those herbicides in those in that new group. But basically, we have not had a new herbicide group that we've been able to use uh, for a very long time. So we're thinking that there are new chemistries coming, there might be. Uh, but realistically, history shows us that the, the chances of that is, is small. And we know from talking with the herbicide companies that there is not a lot of herbicide. Uh, there's not a lot of new herbicides in the, in the pipeline that are still working on the resistant weeds. So next slide, please. So this is uh, just to show, and if you can hit the next slide too, this is just to show uh, when glyphosate was first registered, uh, we call it Roundup glyphosate, whatever you want to call it. And this is just to show the number of resistant weeds that have become resistant to glyphosate. And it, again, increasing very steadily there. I've circled in red um, some of our problems that we have right here in Manitoba. We have three amaranthus species. I'm going to talk briefly about those. That's water hemp, palmer amaranth, and the one at the very, the, the top circle there, at their oval there at the top, uh, the amaranthus hybridus that's actually uh, smooth pigweed uh, we have that in manitoba but it doesn't seem to be much of a problem here kosha also that's the middle uh, oval there that's been uh, been was just glyphosate resistance was discovered there in about 2007 2008 2008 i think it was and so we've been dealing with resistant weeds for quite a while and so it's no surprise that they are increasing the acres are increasing and the intensity on those acres is increasing as well so we're increasing in frequency and also the intensity of the infestations uh, next slide please so this is a slide from Charles Geddes, and this just talks about the number of weeds that are resistant to the different groups. And if you look up there in the upper left corner, in kind of the lime green, we've got group one inhibitors, or, uh, group one, which is our ACC as inhibitors. Basically, those are our, gra our, our grass weed control. We've got green foxtail, wild oat, yellow foxtail here in Manitoba resistant. When we're looking at group nine, right below that in the gray, that's our glyphosate, and our big ones are kochia, downy brome, and water hemp. When we look at group two, that's the big group in the middle. We have a lot of group two herbicide uh, resistant weeds. And there's, and you know, that's a group two is a fairly recent introduction uh, to our herbicide systems. And we, the group two resistance came on very quickly. Um, and we have a lot of different weed species on the prairies that are resistant to group twos. And when we look at the other groups, group threes, group fours, fives, you know, 15 and, and 14 as well, we've got, and you know, definitely most of our weeds that we are dealing with on farm are in this list. Uh, next slide, please. So when we look at our prairie herbicide resistant weed surveys, now these are surveys that we do, we're trying to do them on a regular basis now. Uh, there was one done in, in this, and we're doing them in the same format so that we can track the data over the years. There was a survey done in 2002, and then again in 2016, uh, the abundance survey took place, and I think you have heard me talk about that last year, where we go out and we surveyed about 700 different fields um, across the province for abundance, for weed abundance. So basically what weeds are there, how many are there, what, how many fields there are, and then we we go back and we subsample about a quarter of those fields and we go back and we gather the resistant uh, we gather the weed seeds and we test them for resistance so the weed seeds are grown out and sprayed with different herbicides and then that's where we get these numbers from to talk about the resistant weeds so that that's the resistant weed survey part of the abundance survey and so manitoba uh, we have about 68 percent of our fields that were that were sampled had resistant weeds of some sort so we are slightly higher than Manito than Alberta and Saskatchewan, and those lines they uh, you know they increase quite steadily there. Even if we were to slow down the rate of herbicide resistance, um, we could slow that down. That line we you know could kind of flatten that line off, but that line is not going back down. We are not going to get rid of the herbicide resistant weeds that we have already. We are going to deal with them, and the whole point of this is to try to not get many more, not get that many more. So at the end of the day, when the economics are put to this, it's about almost 24 million acres uh, infested with herbicide resistant weeds. <clears throat> and in some cases, it's multiple herbicide resistant weeds, um, which is a cost of about $530 million annually. Next slide, please. 
So herbicide resistant weeds in the West, the ones that I'm going to talk about mostly here, and we'll briefly go through <clears throat> kochia, wild oats, downy brome, water hemp and palmer amaranth, and then coming soon, I want you guys to be watching for this is Canada fleabane. Next slide, please. So herbicide resistant kochia in Manitoba, um, this study was done in 2018. So this was after, um, after our last abundance survey. And basically, if you look at on the left hand side of the screen, those are the where the samples were taken. And basically anything in red, the red dots are glyphosate resistant. And uh, there's a blue dot is a dicamba resistant. And then the glyphosate resistant and dicamba resistant are the green dots. And there's a few of those in back in 2018. When you look at the resistance frequency, so that tells you where, you know, that there's an incidence of resistance. But when you look at the frequency of resistance um, on the, in the, uh, the, the picture there on the right hand side of the screen, we see that basically in the southwest corner of the province and basically in a lot of places across southern Manitoba, even uh, right south of Winnipeg there, uh, but particularly in the southwest where Lionel's at today, uh, you see that the resistance frequency is at pretty much 100% of the, of the kochia found in those areas is, gly is uh, glyphosate resistant. So at that point, we were 58% glyphosate resistant and 1% that can resistant and again we've done those we've sampled more uh, weed seeds this fall and I fully expect those numbers to increase we know they're increasing because we've we you know we hear it from the you farmers um, that you're seeing more and more uh, glyphosate resistant uh, kochia next slide please so this is um, if you can just hit the next couple uh, this just shows um, the, res the, the resistance in Alberta, just basically how much it's grown. And this is why I fully expect our, our Manitoba numbers to be in line with what Alberta is like. Back in 2012, when they started doing this in this weed resistance survey, there was 100%. The ALSR <clears throat> is ALS resistance. So that's the group twos. That's a group two resistance. Basically, we, we've been assuming that our kochia has been group two resistant for many, many years now, because it, it is. It's 100% resistant to group two. At that time in Alberta, they were 4% glyphosate resistant but as we progress through the 2017 survey and then the 2021 survey it's a still 100 percent group two but now they've moved up to 78 percent glyphosate resistant they've got 28 percent dicamba resistant and 44 percent fluoroxapyr resistance as well so this testing is being done on our manitoba samples so I, again i fully anticipate our numbers to have followed that same progression that alberta has done next slide please when we look at this Venn diagram uh, in Alberta, again, just to show it more, more of a pictorially, I guess, and you look at uh, the 2012 all the way up to 2017, and then 2021 numbers there, your resistance incidence is increasing in all of them. And when you look at the Venn diagram there, you've got, if you look at the very middle part, you've got 10% of your samples are resistant to all three products. So you've got two group four products there, fluoroxapyr, which is, you know, we've been using uh, in a lot of products to go after kochia. We're using dicamba to go after our kochia as well and obviously glyphosate is just not working very much but we are starting to see some cross resistance or multiple herbicide resistant kochia next slide please so this is just to show you we can test in season uh, so this we the, the testing that Charles Geddes does at, 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 at Canada uh, is in Lethbridge is done on weed seeds and they're grown out and then they're sprayed we can test in season and we can send samples to the PSI lab in Winnipeg um, that the pest surveillance initiative lab that is owned by the canola growers and basically they're going to be uh, testing live plants so the plants need to be green they need to arrive in good shape and they need to be they can be tested and so they'll basically test the DNA and they basically are looking for a type of mutation it's called target site amplification and basically the plant is making more than the normal number of copies of enzyme in the plant that the glyphosate attacks normally there's an enzyme in the plant that glyphosate attacks and then the plant dies so what kochia does is it just makes a whole bunch more copies of that enzyme and you can just keep spraying it with glyphosate and the there's just the, the plant does not die from the glyphosate. So if you have less than two copies of that enzyme, the plant is considered glyphosate susceptible. Once you start getting more than three copies of that enzyme, you start to see different levels of glyphosate resistance. And they have had samples in the lab that have been over 100, which means you could pretty much soak that plant in straight glyphosate and it will not die. So we do see uh, this increasing uh, this increasing rate of resistance in in glyphosate in glyphosate tolerant or glyphosate resistant kochia and so that is a really good uh, st uh study to sh a really good uh really good um uh a tool that you have if you are suspecting it, especially at the beginning if you're starting to suspect glyphosate uh, uh, resistance kochia next slide please 
So when we're looking at uh, our last survey data came from 2016, when we're looking um, for group one inhibitor, uh, group one, which is the ACCA's inhibitors, uh, when we're looking at group one resistance in, in wild oat, uh, we see that in Manitoba, 78% of the fields that were sampled had some level of wild of group one resistance. Uh, next slide, please. If we're looking at group two resistance, so our group ones would be, you know, our Puma, our um, Axial, those type of things. When we're looking at group two, this is our Everest, our Vero, uh, our Simplicity, that type of thing. We are a little bit lower, but still, um, again, some resist uh, a fair level of resistance there, but 43% of our fields were resistant to group two. And if we look at our, the next slide, please, um, that's group one and group two together. We had basically 42% of the fields that we surveyed had some type of resistance to of resistant wild oats that were resistant to both group one and group two. And again, if we, you know, we're trying to slow down this rate of resistance, we can maybe slow down the, change the, the steepness of that line. If, you know, the steeper the line, the quicker the resistance is growing. So we could maybe try to flatten that line out and not get, have any more new resistance, but we're never going to go back down to zero. We're never going to get it to go down. Next slide, please. So when we look at, there's other weeds that are um, from our 2016 survey, which is the last time we have the herbicide resistant weed survey, other than the one we did this last summer. And uh, we had, you know, uh, we also were looking at green foxtail. We've got a number of fields with green foxtail, group one and two resistant green foxtail as well, yellow foxtail, and then also barnyard grass. So you can see in there um, that, you know, when we're looking at even we had 27% of our fields uh, were had resistant group, uh, resistant group two barnyard grass. We had 17% of our fields had resistant group two yellow foxtail, but we have other weeds other than wild oats, but obviously wild oats is, is the one that we're most concerned about because the numbers are very high. Next slide, please. We also have group 15 resistance, and this is uh, an unexpected uh, resistance. This is uh, til silfentrazone and pyroxysulfone. Um, that's actually group 14 and group 15. Uh, but that is a bit concerning as well, because this, this was a field that, that those groups had not been used on, or the group 15, the pyroxysulfone, and that's Zidua, or that's in focus as well, uh, a few other products. But that is a group 15 that does have some control of, um, of wild oats. And so that is something to be aware of. Another thing that we need to be aware of is that our group eights are formerly known as group eights, which was our Abidex. <clears throat> Those that group eight designation doesn't really exist anymore. It's been lumped in with the group 15. So we have to keep that in mind when we're looking at choosing different chemicals from different herbicide groups is that group eight and group 15 are all, all they're now one group. So there is no more group eight. Abidex is now a group 15. So we need to be aware of that when we are using something like pyroxysulfone for wild oat control, because it is the same group as Abidex. Next slide, please. So just um, our field crop protection guide, uh, if you can go to the next slide, just if you look at our guide um, and we're looking at if you had group one and group two herbicide resistant wild oats in either wheat and or barley, if you start looking at the products that you can't use anymore, basically anything in red is something that you can't use. I've put the, um, the heritage brand name there as well as the active ingredient because some of these products, we have multiple uh, brand names on them, but basically you would not be able to use anything like an Achieve, Altitude, if you had um, if you had a, a clear field wheat, we'd not be able to use imazimox. A search is gone now, but the uh, imazimethabens would not have worked. Um, and um, axial would be gone. That's a group one. Everest is a group two. Horizon and Puma, Simplicity, Vero, those are group ones and twos. Those are gone. You still would be able to use Abidex and Fortress. Those are pre. So so, um, and they are that group eight or slash, which is actually now 15. And then Fortress is actually a combination of trifluralin, which is a three and triolate. If you're looking at suppression, this is where that pyroxysulfone gives you suppression of wild oats. Um, you could use something like Focus or Fierce. Um, those both have uh, pyroxysulfone plus a group 14 in there. You could use Treflan for suppression. That's a group three, but those are all pre-herbicides. There's not one post herbicide left that you could use once you have full blown group one and group two herbicide resistant wild oats. Next slide, please. So recently discovered is glyphosate resistant downy brome. I believe this was in the fall of 2021. They found this. And so now um, this is, uh, you know, very concerning uh, because we've got, um, because this is our first glyphosate resistant grass in Western Canada. There is glyphosate resistant Italian rye grass in some of the horticulture crops in, in Ontario, uh, but that's not something that we see here in the West at all. Uh, but this is a resistant grass and that is very concerning. So next slide, please. 
And this is just to show you uh, that the rates that, uh, can you just hit the next slide? I think there'll be a circle comes up. Uh, basically, if we're looking at that liter of glyphosate rate, you can see some populations it was still working and other populations a liter of glyphosate is not even phasing down Ebrom. So again, very concerning. Uh, next slide, please. Quickly on water hemp, I've, you've probably seen lots of my scary pictures before, and um, this is our boardroom table in Carmen here. That's the first water hemp I found last year. It's about an eight foot tall plant, and you can see the seed heads on that with my guide to crop protection in the back there. Um, for, for size, you can see how big this plant is. So these things are big, uh, aggressive, uh, they compete for a lot of light, nutrients, water, that type of thing, and uh, these are pretty scary because they're coming in multiple herbicide resistant. Next slide, please. This is again uh, just just to show you how big some of these plants are. This is on um, edge of the edge of a soybean field in a drainage ditch, and just there's my hand there in that upper right hand side. That's the size of this plant after um, you know, and it had been sprayed. This one was on the edge of a soybean field, and the farmer felt that he probably had sprayed it. It was right on the edge, so probably it would have got a shot of glyphosate. But uh, yeah, it uh, yeah it didn't phase it. So next slide, please. So this is just our maps. In 2021, we had one Palmer amaranth sighting in the province and in here near Carmen, but you can see the map on the left hand side is our water hemp map and you can see anything with red is where it has been water hemp has been uh, DNA confirmed. Uh, so because the pigweed species are very similar to each other, they're hard to distinguish. We are using uh, through the PSI lab and through a lab in Ontario as well. We are using DNA analysis to make sure we have the right species. When they're uh, bigger, it's much more easier to tell, but when they're smaller as well, it's very hard to tell them from other pigweed species. So these have been DNA confirmed. If you go to the next slide, our 2022 map is much redder, <laughs> a lot more red on that map. We are now at 16 municipalities um, that have had a DNA confirmation of water hemp in them. And you can see we are slowly moving north and west. And we now have, uh, we have found, had found one plant um, in Alice Archie, which is right on the Saskatchewan border. And uh, we are slowly moving west and that map is just getting more filled in every year. Next slide, please. And if you just needed to compare, there's 2021 on the left and 2022 on the right. You can see that we are finding it more and more. And I fully suspect that it's in other RMs. We just haven't found it yet. So next slide. So we are watching, there is a harmonized surveillance of common water hemp um, at a national level. Um, if you can see in the middle, this is a, a shot of a poster that was done, uh, that's been put together. And you can see our little red dots there, that's Manitoba. Uh, you also can see though um, in Alberta, or sorry, Quebec and Ontario have a huge problem uh, with water hemp as well. And because of this, there's kind of a national coalition through the, um, the, plant, the, the plant Health Council and we, it's called the Weed Surveillance Community of Practice. And so we meet and we um, are monitoring this, this uh, quite closely. Uh, we in Manitoba, we do not nearly have the problem they have in Eastern Canada. So that is very good, um, but we, and we are learning from what they are doing and how they are managing water hemp. And I'm gonna come back to that. We're gonna talk about how they're managing some of these water hemp infestations in Ontario. Next slide, please. So this is just to show you uh, how quickly this grows. And this is such an aggressive plant. It really, this really makes a difference um, in some of the cultural uh, things I'm gonna tell, talk about soon. But for on the left-hand side there, that is water hemp four days after emergence. And in the back pot, it is 16 days after emergence, which it's already about seven to eight inches tall. When you look at Palmer amaranth, which we're not, we are concerned about, but we've only found it in a couple of places once. And so we're watching that. We know we don't nearly have the number of plants that we found for water hemp, but it is very concerning because it's just that much more aggressive. After, um, you know, after four days, it's already a couple of inches tall. I mean, that's crazy. And after less than, or just over two weeks of growth, we're already at a foot tall. And so that is a, this is a very aggressive plant. And like I said, it displaces a lot of light, a lot of nutrients, a lot of water, um, causes, you know, very, very competitive in your crop and causes a tremendous, can cause tremendous yield loss. Next, next slide, please. So this actually is a field of soybeans, if you can see, um, but it's actually really, there's a lot more water hemp in that than soybeans. And I have seen one field like this in Manitoba, the field ended up having to be mowed because the farmer could not uh, get rid of the water hemp. He had already sprayed it twice with a liter of glyphosate, nothing had happened. And uh, because it's a tier one noxious weed, it has to be destroyed. So there's just nothing that could be done. Uh, he could have tried to pick, uh, but when you had um, you know 80 or 160 acres, 
or what, however big your field is of that. And you need to try to handpick that because there's nothing you can spray. It's in, that's an impossible task. And at that point, the field was destroyed. So this is what we could be up against. So more than 20 plants per square foot can reduce soybean yields. Um, next slide, please. Um, and they can, and, and corn, it's caused an average yield loss of 18%, but up to 84%. In fact, there's a recent survey that now they found it can cause up to 99% yield loss in corn. And that makes a profitable crop extremely unprofitable very quickly. And next slide, please. And uh, the average yield loss in soybeans was 43%, but up to 93%. So it can be catastrophic. Next slide, please. So if you do have water hemp, the initial testing results that we have show it is coming preloaded with resistance. It's either resistant to, do, to both group 2 and 9, 9 and 14, or 2 and 9 and 14. So it is coming here already loaded with resistance. It does not appear to be a problem in competitive crops like wheat and canola. The exception, obviously, is clear field canola because there's nothing to spray in there but a group 2, and Roundup Ready canola because you're spraying glyphosate. It's a serious problem in corn, dry beans, sunflowers, and soybeans. Um, because, and at this point, we need to do herbicide layering to get the weeds out early when the crop is non-competitive, especially on our wide row crops. Um, they take a long time to fill in, the, the, and that's in a very aggressively growing plant, and it just takes over. Um, in some cases, your in-crop options are limited or non-existent at this point. If, if we find out, again, we're finding out that uh, the water hemp is already loaded with resistance, then you basically have no options left. So Canada fleabane or horseweed, it's either a winter annual or a summer annual. We've had it in Manitoba for many, many years. It's kind of been lurking on the edge of the ditches. It's at the edge of the bush. And it's it doesn't seem to have moved into the crop too terribly much. Although we've had a couple of reports where we think now we do have glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane. So we'll be, we'll be watching that this summer. But in Ontario, they actually found group nine resistance in 2010. They now have group two resistance as well. But in North Dakota, it's a really big problem south of the border and has been for a very long time. They have biotypes of Canada fleabane or down there, they call it horseweed. Um, they're group two, three, six, and eight, and that's now 15, uh, nine, 14, 15, and 27 resistant slash tolerant. So there is some natural tolerance as well in Canada fleabane, but there's resistance as well. So you've got both. Next slide, please. So that, that's just a quick slide to show Canada fleabane, but we can talk more about ID if we start seeing more of a problem this summer. And uh, next slide, please. So integrated weed management is managing weeds using multiple control tactics and developed agriculture primarily uses um, chemical control. And we need to find herbicide alternatives in the face of growing weed resistance. And the seeder and the combine are integral tools for weed management. It's not just the sprayer. So we have to look at the whole system. So here's just a nice little diagram of integrated weed management. At the very bottom though, the big circle at the bottom or oval, I guess it is, is prevention. That's the big, big, that's the big one is that once, once we have the weeds, we can deal with them in a chemical way, a mechanical way, a cultural way, and biological way. But I, at the end of the day, we need to look, really look at prevention. Next slide, please. This is from Charles Geddes. Um, he had uh, just spoke at um, Crop Connect not too long ago. And basically you're looking at the same type of diagram, but when you're looking at contemporary weed management there on the right, it's primarily chemical. It's and a little bit of cultural, a little bit of physical, but we need to look at integrated weed management, which has a number of different options um, in any of those circles. Um, so with when we look at physical weed management, tillage, mowing, clipping, harvest weed seed control, when we look at cultural, there's a lot of different things we can do with cultural weed management, fertilizer placement, crop rotation, crop life cycle diversity, increasing seeding rate, narrow row spacing, competitive cultivars, um, seeding dates and cover crops. So there's a lot of things we can be playing with in order to increase um, the use of uh, how, how effective cultural weed control is because our chemical weed control is you know, starting to fail in some cases. Uh, next slide, please. So it starts at seeding. Next slide. So this is um, some of Charles's work. Charles uh, is a scientist at Lethbridge and does, uh, you know, phenomenal work in, in weed management. And when we look at the top row is um, wide rows and low seeding rates. And it's uh, that rotation is a wheat, canola, wheat, followed by lentil rotation. And this is a kosher study. So pretty much what they've done then, if you look at the bottom row of pictures, the rows are only nine inches now instead of 18, the seeding rate has doubled. Um, and you can just see the difference all the way through, especially when even when you get to that last slide there, the lentils are yellowing up there, there's still some kosher in there, but there's not nearly the amount of kosher there was when it was wide row and a low seeding rate. So even just making using narrow rows where you can, and using good high seeding rates makes a big difference in how much kosher can come through. Next slide, please. Next slide, 
there's some animation on here. So if you keep going. So if we get to here and then one more. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's okay. Uh, yeah. So here we look at the, the, the doubling the seating, if we're going a narrow row and double the seating rate compared to the low seating rate, we basically have dropped um, the uh, kosher biomass tremendously. Just, and again, chemical control was the same all the way through. This is just playing with uh, seating rates and row spacing. Next slide, please. Uh, again, and again, and one more time, and one more time. And so basically uh, looking at changing seeding rate, you can decrease the kosher biomass by 64% among the two years. And if you're going from wide row down to narrow rows, you can decrease by 56% on that factor alone. And next slide. So basically if you put those two together and you do a combination, you uh, narrow the rows, increase seeding rates, you, re you reduce kosher biomass by 80%, which is huge. That's a huge amount. Next slide, please. So again, if you can go to the next couple and the next one, if we're looking at just um, once we start layering cultural control with chemical tools as well, and go to the next slide, please. Um, this In this case, we're looking at kosher seed bank. So narrowing the rows and increasing seeding rates will decrease the seed bank by 63%. This is really important too with kosher because the, seed, the seeds have relatively short life in soil. So reducing the seed bank can be a tremendous uh, asset um, in trying to you know, stop these infestations from growing and decrease the infestations that we already have. Next slide, please. So looking at crop rotation diversity, our top row there, I guess in the upper right hand corner, they've got an alfalfa meadow brome plot. And there is not a kosher plant in there, which is really good because you're actually cutting it's and that's, you know, intuitive. You're cutting that crop um, at a couple, probably at least once during the season, maybe a second time, depending how the alfalfa regrows. But you would be cutting that you'd not be letting that kosher go to seed. Um, you're removing it, you're basically um, starving out the population because it's an annual weed. It's got a relatively short seed bank life in the soil and you go to something like an alfalfa metabrome and basically the kosher is disappearing in that rotation. Even looking at the top pictures there, that's a spring wheat, canola, spring wheat and lentil rotation. And that's on a narrow row and that's with high seeding rates. And you know, it looks pretty good. Even in that lentil uh, crop at the end, there is some kosher, there's not a lot of products or there's no products really in crop that you can go after kosher within lentil because they're, you, we're using all group twos in lentils. But even when you look at the bottom row, when you put winter wheat in instead of spring wheat, and by the time you get to that lentil year in that lentil phase of the rotation, there's very, very little kosher there. And so just adding um, cropping diversity uh, by adding that winter wheat in instead of the spring wheat has really uh, decreased the seed bank or decreased the seed bank and the amount of biomass of kosher. Next slide, please. So again, uh, next slide, this just shows uh, winter wheat in rotation reduces kosher biomass by 64% and alfalfa metal brome in the rotation reduces kosher biomass by 99%, which so that's huge. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So now we're talking, this time we're talking about kosher densities. So when reducing biomass and densities, but again, winter wheat and rotation reduced the density by 74% and alfalfa metal brome reduced the kosher density by 89%. So that, again, really good, really good results there. Next slide, please. This is an older study from Neil Harker, and this is basically showing the same thing. And this is in wild oat. Uh, we're looking at wild oat biomass at maturity here. In this case, they had a terrible rotation, which was continuous barley. This was out of Alberta. So of course, um, they, that's something that they would do there. And so continuous barley rotation, and then within those, and then versus a barley canola barley pea rotation. So that would be a four year rotation with barley showing up twice. The, that one's on the right hand side of the screen. And within these rotations, you had a short cultivar at a low seeding rate, which was 200 seeds per per um, meter squared, and that's about 20 seeds per square foot, versus a tall cultivar um, and, and uh, at up to 400. So basically doubling the seeding rate and going from a short cultivar to a tall cultivar. So if you, even in continuous barley, if you just simply went from a short cultivar and a low seeding rate all the way to a tall cultivar and a high seeding rate, um, you could reduce the, um, that's the, yeah, right where Lydno's pointer is, um, that green bar there that says 542, you've tremendously reduced the amount of, um, the amount of, of kosher biomass. And if you add a better rotation in on top of that, you reduce that even more. And if you look all together, uh, you put all factors together, the better rotation, uh, taller cultivar, which is more competitive, and also um, a higher seeding rate, you actually can reduce the wild oat biomass by 70 times. And the next slide, please. Then we're looking at wild oat seed production, because again, the less seed there is, the less wild oats are going to grow 
you know, in the future. And we look at that continuous rotation versus the one that has the better rotation and the short versus tall. And if you look at all three factors together, going to a, a four year rotation, going to tall cultivars, going doubling the seeding rate, you are looking at a 37 times reduction in wild oat seeds. And again, th this is huge. And this is not changing anything chemically. Um, this is just the top 10 coming out of that study, um, the top 10 herbicide resistant wild oat um, or weed management practices. And basically there's lots in here, but just the, main, the number one at the very bottom there is crop diversity. And above that is competitive crops and practices that promote competitiveness. That is crucial, especially in the face of increasing herbicide resistance. Um, and the rest of that, I think it's, it's pretty, um, pretty standard. Um, next slide, please. So when we're spraying though, you know, we started with seeding. So there's a lot of different things we can do at seeding with row spacing with uh, like lots of other, you know, fertilizer placement with uh, seeding rates, those type of things, cultivar choice. Well, once we've got that crop growing, what can we do at spraying time? Because we're obviously, we're still using herbicides. That's, that's what we do. We have to. Um, you need to optimize all spraying operations to allow the herbicide to do the best possible job. So that's making sure you've got the right water volume, making sure you've got the right nozzles, you check them for plugging, check them for wear, um, using the appropriate adjuvants, using appropriate ground speed, and basically anything you can do to spray better. You have a limited amount of times that you can use a herbicide before resistance sets in. This is a given. Uh, it's not if herbicides, you, it's not if you get herbicide resistance, it's when. You need to make every drop count of, of the herbicides while they're still working, and they will last longer if you do this. So when we look at herbicide layering, this is using multiple active ingredients from different herbicide groups to control the same weed in the same field in the same year. This is not necessarily in the same tank load, but it can be. So we're talking about using some pre's uh, that have residual, so that, a lot that, that has not just a burn off, but a pre-herbicide that has a pre-seed or a pre-plant herbicide that has um, some type of residual um, control. And sometimes that can last almost season long. Um, this can provide um, improved weed control and return on investment when you don't have resistance um, and layering can be used to reduce multiple resistance in one weed or address several weeds each prone to resistance to different herbicide groups so there will be a day where in a field you will have multiple herbicide resistant weeds you could have a kochia and a wild oat and a water hemp all in the same field and it's just going to get a heck of a lot more complicated in dealing with that next slide please so this is just to show you a kochia infestation. This is pretty standard. We've seen this. This is a salty area of the field. Um, this is some slides that uh, Charles had in a presentation in Alberta. we we'll go to the next slide. Um, we look at this map and they had spring wheat and then in the fall of 2019, the purple area is all kochia. When we go to the next slide, you can see this was faba beans and this is one year later, the fall of 2020. There's an awful lot less um, purple there. We're still seeing it there on the edge. Uh, and I think, you know, we do see that. We see the kochia on the edges because of salinity, but they've really taken down that population and they've done an ethylfluralin blanket, which means they've done ethylfluralin or edge across the whole field and they were patch spraying with sulfentrazone with authority. So they've really done that. But again, you know, you're, it's more complex. It's more money, obviously. And uh, it's a lot more management, you know, looking at rotational crops or you know sensitive crops following uh, the faba beans and that type of thing but they've managed to pull that that kochia population down quite tremendously next slide please when we're looking at harvest weed seed control um, this is basically there's a number of ways you can do this and some of them are pretty easy and some of them don't require much much modification and some require a lot of modification so there's everything from narrow windrow burning using a chaff cart uh, there's actually chaff carts made in manitoba here i think it's called the boomerang uh, cart and it's made at um uh, made in at the decker hutterite colony i believe um, there's bale direct where you're going to be putting uh, the weed seeds on top of the straw you're dropping the straw you're not chopping it you're putting the weed seeds on top and then you're just baling it and taking it off the field so it basically becomes somebody else's problem at that point uh, but you are taking them and some weed seeds when they when they are uh, put through especially if they're if that those bales are fed um, some weed seeds when they go through the digestive tract of, of cattle um, they do uh, it does reduce um, how much they will uh, how much they can they can germinate um, things like redwood pigweed though though it doesn't tend to phase them very much but at that point it does get the weed seeds off your field we're looking at chaff tram lining which is basically just running a shoot of the chaff the chaff has to come down 
it usually goes in behind uh, one of the back tires and then you'll end up just with this little row of 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 ch weed seeds and chaff and it can either be burnt um, or it can kind of self mulch uh, the one thing would be to and and then the weeds weed seeds in there would just kind of um, you know become non-viable um, the one thing is to not spread that around with tillage obviously um, and then weed seed impact mills and this is you know where you've got uh, a, a big capital investment um, but these things these are working and these are uh, being used very extensively in Australia where they've been dealing with herbicide resistant weeds much longer than we have and they've also they're starting to see a lot of these used in the United States especially because of something like uh, like the, the amaranth species like the water hemp and the palmer amaranth um, certain weeds um, retain their seed all the way through till harvest or retain most of their seed um, something like a pigweed does um, cleavers does as well or does um, you know does it whereas something like wild oats a lot of that seed has dropped already so by harvest time a lot of that seed is on the ground already there is still some that can be captured in some way whether it's you know burnt or or taken off the field or whatever um, or um, pulverized basically with a weed seed impact mill but there is ways um, you know there's it, these do, this does work better for some weeds than others but it's crucial to optimize your combine settings to ensure that the weed seeds are captured and so using a combine mo loss monitoring system like bushel plus there are others on the market but that's the one I'm the most familiar with but making sure your combine is optimized making sure that we're getting the chaff and the weed seeds to the right place because then you're going to do something with them so if we can go to the next slide I've just got some pictures um, and again of just again multiple methods of harvest weed seed control because the less weed seeds that are on that ground the less will grow next year and in years following and we see everything from you know dropping them and bailing them uh, this picture here on the upper right we're tramlining you're actually kind of seeing that go um, go in behind your um, it's going in behind the tire there and that's just simply a trough um, that's dropping those weed seeds back there and then we've got a pull behind uh, chaff cart there um, in uh, being towed behind the John Deere there on the bottom left and then the weed seed destructors the original one was the Harrington weed seed destructor, which is the combine, the John Deere combine there on the lower right. It was originally a tow behind model. They are now all bolt on and they fit on every color of combine um, and they're being used extensively around the world. Uh, the Redicop ones are manufactured in Saskatoon and promptly shipped everywhere else. There's a few of these running in the prairies. I think Brianne Tideman, a scientist um, uh, at, um, at Lacombe uh, with Ag Canada, she's doing some work with some of these. And I think she had said um, there's 20 to 30 of these units running in Western Canada right now. And um, they're working, you know, there's there were uh, people are using them because uh, one of the one of the big reasons is weed seed resistance. So next slide, please. So again, this is just what they, a little bit of a close up. There's a number of them. There's the Redicop one up there on the upper right. Now these are all, I think, on green combines, but they fit on all colors. <laughs> so uh, they're, and they bolt in and uh, they draw a lot of horsepower. They're basically, um, their impact mills are basically, um, they crush the weed seeds. The idea is to crush the weed seeds and make them non-viable. So a lot of work going on in the States with these as well as to how to optimize them to make them work the best and make sure that those weed seeds don't, um, it, you know, aren't able to, to grow. Next slide, please. So the capital cost anywhere from fifty thousand to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. There is obviously quite a bit of horsepower to run them, and also we do need to factor in there is nutrients and organic matter lost in removal if you are removing uh, things like straw and weed seeds and that off the field. There is a, a, a cost to that as well. Next slide, please. So I want to quick end here, I think we've still got some time, uh, with some work from Peter Sikama, uh, Dr. Peter Sikama at U of Guelph. Um, multi they have multiple herbicide resistant water hemp. Sometimes you'll see that it's called MHR, water hemp. Um, they had their first case of glyphosate resistant water hemp in 2014 and from 2014 to 2021 they now have uh, it has the herbicide resistance and the spread of the herbicide resistance as well as the number of groups it's resistant to in Ontario has spread rapidly um, and they are now dealing with anything in orange there you see is a five-way resistant water hemp so group two group five group nine group 14 and group 27 is no longer working on that water hemp in those areas. And that has happened in a very short time. So this is why we have to look at what's happening there, what's happening down in the States. This can happen here very quickly. Now in Ontario, most of the cropping system is on a three crop system. It is a soybean, winter wheat, um, corn rotation, um, heavily dependent on glyphosate. Our rotations here in Western Canada, and particularly in Manitoba, are much more diverse than that. Uh, so I'm, this is one of the reasons why we haven't seen the problems yet, but and they're coming on a lot slowly 
a lot more slowly than they have in other places. But in Ontario, the water hemp problem came on fast. And you can see, I fully expect after the 2022 maps, there'll be more red on that map and it'll be more colored in. So next slide, please. I'll show you. Um, what they've done in they've so they have so much water hemp there they're going into fields with existing water hemp problems and um so basically we're look they're looking at what they can do just in addition like uh, in addition to using different herbicides more and better and different herbicides what else can we do so the crop rotation number one there at the top is continuous soybean on wide row they're using nothing but roundup their timing is post they're using it in crop and that's one moa means one mode of action so that is if you remember back to one of my very first slides that is very very high risk for um, developing herbicide resistance. Even if you're going to stay in a continuous soybean rotation, but you narrow the rows, now they're on a narrow row, and now you're adding some pre-herbicides in. They're using Fierce, which is, we have that here in Manitoba. That's a 14 and a 15. They're using Roundup Extend, which is using the dicamba, as well as the glyphosate post. You've now still got one crop, but you've narrowed the rows, and your mode of action is now at four, which is great. If we start adding in more cropping diversity, we've got a narrow row soybean, and we add corns. If you look at number three there, we start adding in field corn. Um, we're still looking at a pre and a post on our soybeans, and for their corn, they're doing a pre and a post. Those names, we have similar products here in Manitoba, but they're basically using atrazine and group 15 and some group 27s, and in Manitoba, our group 27s are things like Laudis and and um, Impact and Armazon and, and Shield X, those type of things. And then their marksman is a dicamba atrazine. So they're using two crops, they're using pre and post herbicides, and we've now got six modes of action, which is great. Um, if we look at a different crop and using wheat instead of soybean, instead of the corn there, um, we are now looking at in, in their wheat, they don't have a lot of wild, they don't really have any wild oat issues. They tend not to use any graminicides in their wheat. And so they are just using infinity followed by Liberty post harvest. And they've got uh, two crops and a seven modes of action. If you hit the next slide, please, Lionel. Their uh, best rotation or the most complex rotation, the one with the most, um, the most diversity in it is corn, soybean, wheat, winter wheat, um, followed by a cover crop um, using pre and post uh, products in the corn and the soybean and then using um, having that cover crop in the wheat. Now again, cover crops will work. I think they can work elsewhere in the world very well. In Manitoba, they can work. We tend not to have the season at the end of our, you know, after we've combined our crops, we don't have a lot of season left and we may not have a lot of moisture some years. So I don't think we're going to see the benefits probably that everywhere else in the world is talking about because they just have longer seasons than us. But in Ontario, they have a longer season. Cover crops are helping them with their uh, with their with their weed management. So this is a their most diverse rotation. They've got pre and post herbicides in there. They're using cover crops and they've got eight modes of action. So if we can go to the next slide. So and then um, if we um, what we here see here is basically decreasing what they, the object, objectives of the study was to decrease the water hemp seeds in the seed bank. How many, you know, after three years in this study, how many weed seeds can they, re, can they, re, can they reduce? Um, you know, cause they're this, these are fields with exist with really high populations. So if you can actually um, hit the next slide and then the next one, and then the next one, next one, next one, next one, and just stop there. So when they actually went to that most complex rotation, which was the corn and the soybean and the wheat followed by the cover crop, they were able to reduce the amount of weed, when it, water hemp seeds in the seed bank by 82%. And that is phenomenal. If you hit the next slide, the problem is, is that that reduced it from 165 million seeds per acre to 30 million seeds per acre, because these are fields that are already heavily infested with water hemp. But just cultural controls like like diversity, using cropping diversity, using row spacing, and then obviously using different chemistries, that that's going to that's going to help. Um, in this case, in this particular study, uh, they, this was a, a water hemp density of 4,000 plants per square meter, which is a roughly 400 water hemp seed plants per square foot. I don't know how you grow anything when there's that much water hemp in there, uh, but Dr. Sikema um, is why well, I was. Uh, was saying just the other day that his students had found a field last summer uh, where it was heavily, heavily infested with water hemp and it was 8,000 plants per meter squared, which is 800 per square foot. So basically there are fields out there that have double the amount of water hemp than this particular study did. So this is huge. Um, next slide, please. 
Uh, so the whole point is to not get there. So if you can just hit the next slide, but we, we basically have to proactively introduce more diversity in the crop weed management programs. We, that's what we have to do. So implement a diverse crop rotation, plant in narrow rows where possible, really for our sensitive crops, the crops that are most vulnerable, it's really only soybeans we can do that with, but still, you know, use tillage at strategic points in the rotation. This is very important. That's a tool that we've really mostly forgotten about most of us, but I think we have to be able to use that where we can. Next slide. Um, you need to plant, now this is again coming from Ontario, they were planting cover crops after winter wheat combining, that may or may not work here, but you know, it's something that we can look at. Um, and next slide, please. Um, purchase a combine with harvest weed seed control. And after that, um, utilize multiple herbicide modes of action. So this is what came out of their study. And this is what we're, we're trying, I think we're trying to do this anyways, but we've got to get better at doing this. And next slide, please. So weed control for the future, it's a lot more management. Uh, there's a lot of information available through management of agriculture, through crop insurance, industry webinars, but the relationship with your agronomist, your industry and retail is going to be crucial for planning this year and, and onward. This is getting very complex. Things are getting very, very complex and it's a lot more management. The easy button, uh, it doesn't work anymore. Um, provincial weed surveys, these are crucial for gathering data on weed trends and resistant weeds. And again, we're hoping to have a whole new um, bunch of data available for you and in, in within the next year coming from the survey that we did just this past summer and my next slide is my last one i think um so the weed control for the future there's new herbicides there's no silver bullet coming um again we might at some point get some new chemistry but we can't count on that at all you just cannot be counting on that you've got to be doing these things now and if that silver bullet comes that's great but Really, I doubt it's coming. Um, herbicide resistance, it's not if, it's when. And make, we have to make our herbicides work as long as they can um, and make every drop count. And so we need to go back to the basics, which is integrated weed management and growing good competitive crops. And the ultimate goal should be to reduce the amount of weeds that see an in-crop herbicide spray. And with that, that's all I have. Oh, sorry, yes, I do have a couple of slides here. There's a couple of really good websites. This is the Herbicide Resistant Action Committee website. They have lots and lots of stuff on there. That's a really great website to be visiting. Um, lots of information. And then the next one is Grow. It's called Getting Rid of Weeds Through Integrated Weed Management. They have a lot of tools on there as well. So there's a lot of really good stuff on there as well. So those are a couple of websites that I would encourage you to visit if you've got the time. And that's all I had. Thanks. Okay, Kim, uh, great. Uh, there's been a few questions coming in. So uh, I'm going to start uh, with, with them right now. So uh, mm -hmm. how do it list soybeans play into resistant management with kochia and other weeds mm -hmm. spectrums and herbicide mode of action, of action diversity? Yeah, and the soybeans, I think, are going to be absolutely great for water hemp. Uh, the, uh, the kochia is more challenging. Um, 2,4-D traditionally has not done a good job on kochia. Now we do have to, we do have group four resistance to kochia or kochia has group four resistance, not necessarily to 24 d and MCPA, um, not to the growth regulator um, family there of the group fours, but uh, that is a challenge. That's going to be challenging. And there are, you know, maybe using some Liberty, using going at that from a number of ways with those enlist soybeans, because you've got, you know, you've got the option to use, well, glufosinate or Liberty, you've got the option to use the 24 d choline, and you've got the option to use the, the glyphosate. So it's not, it's going to be challenging. I think it can work, but it's going to be challenging and it's certainly not going to do the number do be as well as when we, you know, we're using extend beans. The dicamba for us, <clears throat> it is still working. We, the resistance is growing, um, but you know, for now it is still working. And I, I think we need to keep using that um, and, and in rotation with other tools as well. Um, but di the dicamba system for us is still working, but we do know it is starting to fail elsewhere in the world. So we do have to watch that. But yeah, the enlist system, uh, kosha is not, that's not going after kosha. That's not a strong point on that system. Okay, good. Um... A question regarding uh, herbicide resistance and uh, once I have it to a certain chemical, is the resistance going to be on my my field for good or am I ever going to be able to use that chemical again? Yeah, it probably in your lifetime, whoever's asking, unless you're really, really young, um, but pretty much it's there for life. Um, once it's there, it's there. They, it, they, it doesn't go away. Um, 
uh, I know there were studies uh, where where some herbicide resistant weeds were found. I think it was wild oats in uh, in Alberta, and this is a number of years ago, where they had you know full, you know they had group one resistance and they hadn't used a group one product in many 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 years. Came back, tried to use a group one product. It worked all right for maybe one year, and then it was you're back to you're back to full blown resistance because the seed bank is there. Um, wild oats can live a very long time in the soil, but basically once you have resistance, you have it for life. It would be very rare that that it didn't come back, but it's it's there for life. Okay. Um, uh, we haven't used uh, pre-emergent herbicides for a while. Uh, what is the soil life of the product and can I use them several years in a row along with in-crop spraying? Yeah, you have to watch certain chemistries will say in, in, in our guide to crop protection on the product pages that sometimes it'll say do not use more than once every two years. Um, I think we do need to be careful. You can't all of a sudden be throwing the same pre herbicide on every single acre every single year, even if you wanted to, you, you shouldn't be doing that. We do need to be using rotation. But if you're using an in crop product as well, like a post product for, for, for post um, emergent spraying, um, that that's good i think that we have to look at the pre's like something like the enlist system in beans um you know using a pre-herbicide up front that's going to help tremendously i think that's where you've got to look at that because you know your in crop options there are not great but we have to really sit down and look at your rotation and look at where the pre's fit i think they fit on every field it's just a question of which one you use and when because you have to have a rotation in those as well and really we could cover every acre we've got with the pre herbicide with residual um, it's going to cost a lot more money but we have to be careful doing that because it's just the same as as, as rotating our post herbicides we have to rotate them as well and just because you can use it on every acre every year doesn't mean you should be we have to be very careful with them because that's kind of our last line of defense once we start to get some of these resistant weeds in so again that's why i said sitting down with your agronomist or your retail person your industry your 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 industry reps um, we have phenomenal people in manitoba at every level of of that of of like uh the between the retails and the industry reps and the agronomists we have phenomenal people here and so it's but it's a lot more management and it's a lot more complicated and it's a lot more long-term planning okay is there another weed that looks similar to Canada fleabane? Uh, this, uh, I guess the question is, yeah. is, is there another one that looks similar? Um, yeah, I don't know. I know what it is. I mean, I've been watching that for 20 years because it has been a problem in the States for probably close to 30 years. And I don't know why it hasn't been an issue here. When it comes up at the beginning, uh, it almost looks like hairy stinkweed. Stinkweed though is never hairy and has that that smell. But lots of times it comes up as a as a rosette on the ground. And sometimes the leaves are very rounded looking. And I think if my pictures, there's one picture where the leaves are it can fool you when it's small because sometimes the leaves are very rounded. Um, the one thing though, if you um, uh, when it gets a little bit bigger, it it can look a bit like kochia as well, but it grows very upright and then it's kind of bushy at the top. The, and down in the States, they call it horseweed or mare's tail. I guess it's supposed to look like a horse's tail. I'm not sure, <laughs> um, but we call it Canada fleabane and it, it can be quite tall. Like it can be, you know, armpit height, I guess, you know, four foot tall kind of thing and um and it has lots of fluffy fluffy little seed heads like they're like dandelion seed heads but really a lot like small fluffy little things and they can fly float around so i don't know like when it's smaller it can fool you a bit it almost looks like kosher first coming up because it's hairy but then if you see that rosette it looks very much like a stinkweed but it's got hairs and i don't know if you have time lionel to flip back to the pictures i don't know if you can see but there is a distinctive feature i can show you but i'd have to show you the picture if you can go all the way back to the canada fleabane um one there's two little there's little notches these little notches on the upper third of the leaf and it's very distinctive and i don't know it's um once you see that, that's very distinctive. They, nothing else has that that I've ever seen. Sorry, that's all the way. Oh, back right there. One more. Okay, you can kind of see in this picture on the upper right corner here. Um, there's these little backward notches. There's lots of teeth on these leaves, but sometimes there's bigger notches just on the upper third. On the rounded ones, you see it really well. Yep, you see that on that upper third of the leaf. But that rounded, the rounded edge on the leaf doesn't stay very long. Normally, the leaves kind of get long and pointy, like the picture to the left there. And but you do still see those little notches in that upper third of the leaf. That's quite distinctive for Canada fleabane. So it's hairy and it has those little notches and then when it gets bigger if you look at that picture down in the bottom right hand corner there in a bean field um, I mean it's pretty distinctive you know that's a single plant and then there's an infestation 
there. So. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, thanks a lot, Kim. That was a lot of really good information. Thanks for for preparing that for us today, and uh, um, got some good questions again as well. So um, that's great to see. And I'm just going to go back to my main screen here now, and uh, wanted to bring everybody's attention to the Yield Manitoba books that are out now, the 2023. I got to look at a couple, one of the books here the other day, and uh, there is a ton of really good information. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through it, but if you've got questions about how different varieties yield in your zones or your crop insurance risk areas, uh, definitely grab this book and look at them. They've got it broken down as to uh, varieties and yield and uh, it's just there's a lot of really great information if you're looking at uh, choosing a variety that'll be more suited for your area and uh, so yeah definitely uh, grab that book uh, like I said uh, there's a lot of really great information in it. Uh, Seed Manitoba is also available right now so grab that as well it'll help you in making decisions for your for your seeding uh, plans uh, again, the slide on the environmental farm plan that now is online. There's a lot of programs being announced out there. So, and a lot of them have, have uh, uh, are connected to the environmental farm plan. So this would be a good way to get yours done or updated. Uh, we have one more uh, winter crop talk and then there'll be the, the, we'll get into our spring and summer crop talks and they'll start on April the 12th. There's the registration uh, for uh, link for regist registering for those ones. Again, our crop production extension specialists, uh, a good group of uh, agronomists that are, you know, really good, uh, have really good advice. So if you've got questions, definitely uh, give any one of us a call. Uh, our livestock people, again, very busy doing stuff uh, with, with uh, planning on doing some, still doing some rations for some people. And, uh, and that, uh, our MASC offices, uh, definitely, uh, uh, go there and grab that uh, Yield Manitoba book. It's uh, really good. And then and you can talk to them about some of the things they have going on. Uh, our hay listing, there's still a fair bit of hay out there for sale. So if you're wanting to get yours uh, sold or if you're looking to buy some, there's our, our hay listing site. And thanks for joining. And our next crop talk will be on uh, March the 15th.